Welcome to Cooper Union. What's happening with human rights around the world on ThinkTech, broadcasting from our downtown studio in Honolulu, Hawaii, and Moana Nui Akea. I'm your host, Joshua Cooper. And the title of today's episode is Nuclear Free and Independent Pacific Forever, Pacific Nations Reflect on Rights. Joining me today are two amazing advocates from Moana Nui Akea, the Grand Pacific, and I'd like to thank them both for joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you yeah, for having absolutely. Thank you for having us. It's a pleasure to have you. We're here today because March is commemorated in Oceania to reflect on the human rights movement for self-determination through decolonization and demilitarization. And our conversation will focus on the power of peaceful movements rooted in cultural contributions for social change in the Pacific. March 1st, though, is also known as Nuclear Victims Remembrance Day. Kali, could you share with us why that's such an important date that we should all focus on and really reflect on throughout all of March? Well, March 1st is really important in the Pacific because, uh, you know, all of the nuclear testing that happened, um, you know, it was conducted by mainly the U.S. and the U.K. and um, in different parts of the Pacific. And it's a legacy that a lot of Pacific Islanders have forgotten about. So with March 1st, we can raise awareness about the injustice of, you know, all the nuclear testing that has happened and all of the islanders who lost their indigenous land, you know, in the Marshall Islands, uh, entire islands were sunk and people still haven't been able to return to their home islands because of it. Thank you so much. And Manu, would you like to add a bit as well about March 1st? Um, yes, um, as what uh, Dale was uh, mentioning, that it is a legacy for every specific individual. Um, it stands as a remembrance of uh, what um, was scarred into our hearts, uh, what happened to us before we will not be um, forgotten. So uh, March 1st um, acts as a, a reminder to each and every individual that um, uh, it is a very important date for us, yeah, for nuclear um, activities, yeah, that happened. Yes, March 1st was the commemoration of the Bravo test, which was, you know, the first one, but how many were actually conducted, Talay, and, and what are some of the long-term consequences related to this horrible, really atomic annihilation? I'm not sure about the exact number of tests that were conducted, um, but I do know that because they were conducted in the Marshall Islands, um, islands were sunk, and because they didn't even give uh, proper equipment to the islanders, in some cases, like in Kiribati. Um, so people were affected, like health wise, and they didn't know what was happening to them. Like, I read that some islanders thought that um, there were snowflakes from the ashes that were falling, and they didn't know that it was poisonous, so they just stayed where they were. Maybe Manu would probably know more about. Well, I know one thing, one test is too many. And we know that they were into the 66 or 67. But Manu, please share your perspective as well. Um, based on what I've known that uh, the United States have, uh, well, probably technically um, released 66 nuclear bombs into the Marshall Islands. And that has um, affected a lot of people, um, probably um, caused diseases as well. And would uh, um, probably uh, also um, added on 170 cancers from that. That, that is based on the national um, uh, cancer Institute analysis, which um, I have read yet before. Mm -hmm. Well, and Tale, you brought up such an important point is that no one knew what was happening and the lack of really free prior informed consent by the military at the time to at least let people be aware is truly 
a crime against humanity to see the way that was done and over and over and over again. Yeah, and there's been no justice, you know, all these years later. Um, it's a part of Pacific culture to be very welcoming. And I think sometimes we can be too welcoming, we can be very naive. When uh, foreigners come to our shore, we allow them to, you know, come into our homes. And, and uh, in many cases, we listen to what they tell us is best for us, you know, especially all those years ago, um, I can imagine just what the Islanders believed was happening. Um, and I did uh, watch this documentary where these American soldiers were saying they're doing this for the, you know, advancement of mankind and, and to make mankind better. Um, but yeah, they just destroyed these people's communities and took away their homes. Mana, would you like to add on those points? Um, I just wanted to add on that, like, uh, the, the ocean is what uh, the Pacific people rely on and having these uh, nuclear activities being brought into the, the Pacific, it was quite new for us to um, be introduced into this um, nuclear weapons and all those. And so um, having, having us rely on the ocean is crucial. And um, yeah, and I, I think we should also increase awareness that we should also have, um, that these people have rights to a healthy environment. And so, yeah, that's all. Thank you so much, Manu. And you bring up so many points, both of you, because Oceania is a region that's rooted in respect and reciprocity. And the people's movements have actually shaped the Pacific to be one of resilience with aspirations for all. But you really both brought up some excellent points. First, to lay that there was really a lack of any respect at all for those cultures, that they would conduct all of those tests. And the point that you raised, it was done in Micronesia by the United States. But then also you had France doing the testing in the Pacific down in French occupied Polynesia. So you could see that really throughout all of Oceania, there were nuclear tests done. And more importantly, there was no attention to try to help to prevent some of these health risks and more importantly, deaths. And the other aspect that Manu brought up as well that I think we can dig deeper into is the contamination, the nuclear, the shelf life is forever. And bringing that in without ever thinking of the people, I think to lay about a point that I remember in a video too, that they had goats and people and they were thinking of the people as human guinea pigs. And the last point you raised was saying it was, we we're sacrificing the people of Micronesia for the betterment of human security, for the future of peace with mankind. And all those points, I think we, should, we could really dig at and explore deeper. Yeah, they would never have tested these nuclear weapons uh, on US soil, you know, when they were talking about uh, advancing, uh, you know, humanity and how this is a, the best thing for mankind. They would never have done it in their home country because they knew that what they were doing was going to affect these people, you know, possibly forever. Thank you. And they did, unfortunately, they did test even, but it's always testing, I think, where it brings up this issue that maybe, Mana, you were hinting at, but environmental racism, because it, they did do it in the United States, in Nevada, where the Western Shoshone people are. But if we look at the trend of almost any country or imperial power, they only do it where the indigenous peoples live and have never respected really the sacred relationship with the environment. And what you said really reminds me as well, we were in Tahiti during those nuclear tests and we went there to protest that with Abolition 2000. And it's that aspect of not recognizing the humanity in the indigenous peoples, that, that racism, but then also linking it with the climate crisis we have now today. If no indigenous peoples would have ever done such thing as a nuclear test to mother nature, knowing the consequences of how that would ripple down stream. But the West ability to compartmentalize and not connect consequences has had huge impacts for all of humanity. 
Manu, is there anything you'd like to build on that? Well, I want to add on, um, since you've mentioned like uh, the imperial countries, they um, directly affected, um, especially indigenous um, countries such as Tahiti. Um, I think uh, one of the main reasons why we're still struggling is because the um, indigenous countries, um, they spread across the, um, the vast Pacific Ocean. And so communication tends to be quite a problem there. Um, so uh, reaching out, um, it, this hinders the communication that might otherwise effectively um, give, extend the sufferings, like here, the sufferings in Tahiti and from nuclear testings such as that. So yeah, that is all that I wanted to add on. No, and you brought up a great point that I know most recently, uh, the Marshall Islands are now members of the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva, and they're pushing the aspect of the right to a clean and healthy environment. And they were one of the sponsors when that was just adopted in September of last year. So that right to a clean, healthy environment is now recognized in international law to have a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. What you brought up as well, though, is it's true, the legacy of nuclear colonialism continues because indigenous peoples and Pacific Island nations in some ways are not able to control that land. And that the sad part is, I remember being in Tahiti when we were there, you knew that the fish that everyone was eating because that is the refrigerator, that's where everybody gets their, their nutrients. We know that the tests have been happening there and that the fish were contaminated. And so it's putting together all of those aspects. What are some of the most important health issues related to cancer that have been documented that everyone in the world should be aware of going forward? Tale? Right, I think Manu can probably expand on this further. Okay. Um, well, from what I've uh, um, um, read that um, based on the article of uh, nuclear, uh, sorry, National Cancer Institute, they mentioned that um, uh, possibly because cancer is, um, of course, is uh, um, sorry, made by radioactive, ex, like uh, exposed to radioactive, but they have mentioned that um, certain parts of the body, such as um, thyroid, stomach, colon, it's caused by this excessive um, radioactive due to nuclear um, fallout. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's that aspect of the most important right is really the right to help. And health is wealth and health is everything as we all know. But unfortunately, the actions by the government of these empires of Europe and the US that are then in the Pacific have this lasting legacy. What should be done now to change these poor conditions, do you think? How can we reverse the trend? I think that the um, US should start to uh, teach their own people about the nuclear legacy that they created in the Pacific. You know, they should acknowledge what happened here and what, you know, their former government did um, because it's not like the people who are in power now did this to the Pacific, but they can definitely make reparations by, you know, acknowledging it, um, apologizing for it and, then moving forward, looking at how they can help the environment, uh, what they can do for the um, nuclear tomb that's in the Marshall Islands. Uh, we've all read that it's leaking and you know, some scientists say it's just as toxic outside now as it is inside. Um, and the American government hasn't really made a serious commitment to what they're gonna do to help the Marshall Islands now. No, that's an excellent point, bringing up the dome. And what we're talking about is not ancient history. It still exists now, and it's impacting people's lives in the islands today. That's why every person matters and every hour matters when we think what could be done and how we should do that. Manu, what would you like to add to that? 
Um, I think um, the very term nuclear reaction is foreign to Pacific people. And although our lives are so much dependent on nuclear energy from the sun, we need to talk with the people. Um, tala tala noa, the cultural activity of tafono to increase awareness via targeted uh, strategies, spread the word, uh, make things visual so that um, pictures can imprint the effect words alone cannot do. So specific people are visual learners. They want hand-on activities that relates to our everyday living, make activities meaningful and thoughtful, provoking. If this is, if, if, if this is the effect on them, what about, what about us, our little country? Yeah. No, it's, it's a powerful point. And when we think also about what's going on today in Ukraine, the world could be facing, even though we said we were doing this to prevent this from all future conflicts, we could be having that happen very soon. And what is it about nuclear that every nation on the world needs to know to make sure that it doesn't happen to anyone else? Uh, well, we see, especially in the Pacific, I, I don't know um, how things are in Hawaii, but in Fiji, we just see it as such a foreign uh, issue that, you know, nuclear weapons could never affect us. And uh, a, a lot of my Fijian friends don't even know that um, nuclear testing was done so extensively in the Pacific. And I think that we really need to make people understand, especially you know here that uh, nuclear weapons, nuclear power plants, it's such a current issue that at any time it just takes one dictator um, to make a decision that will change millions of lives, you know, destroy the environment that people live in, that will cause uh, refugees for decades to come, and you know who knows what the fallout will be if the Russia and Ukraine uh, conflict escalates. You really bring up the most important point ever. Pacific Islanders living on islands have a better understanding of the fragility of this beautiful planet we live on. And that one step, one action can actually destroy it, not just for the people today, but for many future generations. Mana, is there anything you'd like to add regarding what the people of the Pacific have as a message for the rest of the world because of the historic harms that have happened due to the atomic annihilation through these tests in Oceania? Well, um, I think that uh, Pacific people would want uh, their voices to be heard out into the open, even though we are very, um, we are small, but we are significant. And that's the saying that goes out to each and every one of us. Um, we have this uh, thing that um, I would agree with Dali that um, from our end, we think that nuclear activities is just um, uh, foreign activities. Um, so it's quite new for us that nuclear reaction, it's really um, foreign for us, um, Pacific Island. But the impacts that we have, we are the ones who are most vulnerable to it. So I think that uh, um, the imperial countries should, uh, should have a second thought on what they are doing, especially um, the nuclear fight between Ukraine and Russia. It's so true. I mean, and as we look at March as nuclear free and independent Pacific forever, reflecting throughout this entire month, we really understand that the human rights movement primary focus is self-determination, as well as social justice dedicated to protection of the Pacific Ocean. And really, we see so many crises impacting the islands at the same time. We see this one with nuclear still lingering. We see the COVID crisis. We also see the climate one. And I think that's probably the lesson and more importantly, the vision and values that the Pacific can share with the world as we look at the future and this only one planet that we have, the issue of self-determination could have been taken because nuclear testing and people not able 
as Tele brought up in the beginning, to return to that sacred land to harvest it because of its contamination. But the same we can say for self-determination with climate crisis. I know I was in Fiji uh, as well in 2020 before all had changed for many of us. And Fiji had moved some of the first villages with a human rights-based approach regarding the climate crisis. Maybe you could share with us some aspects of the voice from the Oceania for the whole world on the current climate crisis and how we can guarantee self-determination for all people to live. So in Fiji, I think that um, personally, if we're going to you know, combat the climate crisis and uh, you know, have more conservation, we need to uh, go back to practicing our own culture. Um, we have lost a lot of our culture, especially in, in recent years. Um, we have had uh, our uh, ethnicity renamed from being Fijians uh, as the indigenous people to um, it's okay, um, which is not a word that was special to us, I would say. And then we are also slowly losing the management of our land because indigenous Fijians own the majority of land in Fiji. Uh, and when we own our own land, we actually conserve it much more. And I was a part of research uh, recently about deforestation of islands. And we found that if a foreigner owned an island, uh, so much of the island, um, they had, you know, uh, so much deforestation, but if it was kept in our hands, you know, like my own island and other islands in, in my province for my VT, we keep nature um, as it should be. You know, we don't just cut down trees and call it development um, for us. Uh, culturally, that wouldn't be development. Uh, I was recently in my island and I was talking to my uh, aunties, uh, my aunts about how we can help to develop our island. And they were saying, no, we must leave nature as it is because you know, when we leave the environment as it is, it serves us. Um, if we were to change that, then we don't know uh, what will happen, you know, how it will destroy the environment. So I definitely think that going back to our own cultural values, our own um, you know, indigenous conservation will help. It's an excellent point and it's true when they look at the world with 5% of the land in indigenous hands, that's where 80% of the world's biodiversity is. So what you're saying is absolutely correct. And also the UN sustainable development goals, those 17 global goals are really the wisdom of indigenous peoples and definitely that you see in Fiji on a daily basis prior to contact and colonization. And so I appreciate those aspects that you're sharing in Fiji and the last part I remember when I was there was we were trying to stop a Chinese corporation from black sand mining just there up the road from uh, Nandi. And we were able to then stop that. But it was, it was, of course, deals that were made by corporations in the name of development that were really destruction and in a way ruining the most beautiful, one of the most beautiful countries in the world, of course. It looks like we, uh, one last thing we could say as we're closing today is in Fiji, I know that's really seen as the center of uh, Oceania in many worlds. Of course, the UN has all of their agencies there. And I know right now, I think the Commission on the Status of Women is also looking at the important issue of the environment and climate. Is there anything you'd like to share with the world from Fiji about what we should do going forward? I've been um, a part of these, these groups that have been researching like conservation and I also work in conservation um, uh, full time. And uh, we've just keep finding that, um, you know, traditional fisherwomen in our villages, um, they have uh, very sustainable practices for fishing or uh, conserving their coastline. And um, these are just things that we need to teach people uh, and encourage in the next generation because Fijians are losing so much of our uh, culture. I think in my generation, um, we need to bring back, uh, you know, 
workshop to teach our own people, our own language, and uh, how our culture is wrapped up in the language. And then conservation is such an important part of the culture um, because we have to keep our land and we have to keep our coastline for the next generation. Passing it on for our descendants is so important. That's probably the best way to end is really we are the kapuna are the ancestors for future generations and we have to leave the world better than we found it. But you really bring up some great points because those values that have been really lost and targeted by the colonial powers, we must really dig deep into the language, into the culture and revitalize those. And I've seen many aspects of that happening with the vaca, with the canoe here with Hokulea, but also in Fiji as well. And Hopefully we can navigate a path together to make sure that not only in March, but throughout the world and throughout every month, people are aware of Oceania and the beauty and the bravery of the people of the Pacific. Thank you so much for joining us today and look forward to organizing more in the region and make sure that Oceania is able to exercise that right of self-determination and be nuclear free and independent forever. Thank you so much for having me and Anu. I hope our internet connects again. Mahalo Nui. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.